That was close. You almost had me there. Where's Irv? <clears throat> Biggest scene stealer since Brando. Anyway, picking up from the last video, I have some final things I'd like to say about what, why, and how questions. Now, when you ask a what question, you're eliciting a list as an answer. In the last video, I used me chatting up some woman in a bar as an example. I asked her, well, what are you doing to keep yourself happy today? And I got a list. Well, I did the food, and then the food, and then the hand, and then the that, and then, okay. The problem is there's nothing particularly sexy about a list. Unless you're an accountant. My point is, if you ask a how question, you'll get an answer better than a list. There are why questions. I find them particularly interesting because when you ask why, you're eliciting a defense of behavior. Why did you do that? Well, I, and then I, and then I, uh, the ego has jumped into the mix, and now it's going to take twice as long to get to the bottom of whatever it is that's going on. Here at Sticky Soap Film, I'm a one-man shop. I do it all. I'm even the hairdresser. However, if all of you out there turned me into a rich and famous video producer tomorrow, well then I could hire somebody. I get to play boss first time in my life. Not that I'm kidding myself that it's going to be easy straight. I can picture a scenario a boss would find himself in. The boss gives Irv a task to complete. And he leaves for a half hour. And then he comes back and he looks and he's like, Irv, why is everything so fucked up? And Irv would defend himself by going, but I, but I, and I, but I, all right, Eric, let me, let me rephrase that. How is it that everything is so fucked up? And this gives Irv an opportunity to focus. All right, I put the who's it's and the what's it's, stuck in a widget, finagled it around, but when I started turning the thingamabob, these whatchamacallits started flying off. Oh. <laughs> I see what the problem is. I know how to avoid this in the future. So, let us return to Chapter 2 in Language and Thought and Action and the topic of language as symbolism. Of all forms of symbolism, SI tells us, language is the most highly developed, most subtle, and most complicated. Human beings have agreed in the course of centuries of mutual dependency to let the various noises that they can produce with their lungs, throats, tongues, teeth, and lips systematically stand for specified happenings in their nervous systems. We call that system of agreements language. And just to be specific, when it comes to what I mean by a symbol, take Carl Jung's man and his symbols and pitch it over your shoulder. What Carl is talking about is not what we mean by symbol. We mean it in its simplest form. Something can stand for something else. Stand for, not is something else. An expensive new car is used as a symbol of affluence. Stands for, not is affluence. 
SI wants us to understand that distinction. In all the languages of the world, I'm pretty sure there is a noise for agreement. In English, it's yes. In Spanish, it's si. In German, it's jawohl. In French, it's we. Oui. And then there's Russian, okay. Oh, maybe 12, 13 years ago, I knew this woman down in Squirrel Hill who was from Belarus. And she spoke Russian, spoke English with a heavy Russian accent, considered herself Russian. <laughs> and I'll never forget this one time. I was asking her, why did you feel that way on this particular issue? And she looked at me over her shoulder and she said, Cause I'm Russian. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Very proud, very smart. Do not underestimate the pride of the Russian people, Amerikansky. But anyway. Um, she was in a jam. The bus wasn't running. She had to get to the other side of the neighborhood because she had an appointment to sign a lease. She was running some property or something. She's like, can you drive me over to where I need to be? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Hop in the car. So we're driving, right? And she's on the phone talking to someone and she's talking in Russian. And all of a sudden I hear, da 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 da. I'm like, wow. She's saying yes awfully fast. Da 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 I mean, I couldn't say, I couldn't, I'm not even saying it as fast as she did, right? I mean, I'm picturing the Red Army capturing Berlin in 1945 as she's doing this. Da 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 But we can make an interesting point here. You don't hear anybody in English stringing yeses like that. But she did it without any problem, and I'm like, it underscores a point. People whose native languages are different from ours, they don't think like us. No, uh, the language is different, the thinking is different. People who speak Turkish don't think like us. People who speak Farsi don't think like us. Mandarin Chinese, you name it. Understanding people from other cultures takes some work. Now, a little kid might say, if you ask a little kid, why is a pig called a pig? He might say, a pig is called a pig because it's a filthy animal. Now, you got to think this one through, but what the kid is really saying and doesn't realize it is the word came before the animal. And that's absurd. We're seeing another example of the map is not the territory, which is a mistake people make more often than they realize or will admit. The phonetician, Lady Foge, at the end of his book, Vowels and Consonants, said something I found pretty amazing. Bear with me. When you talk, you don't join vowels and consonants together for the simple reason that they are not stored separately. Talking involves pulling stored forms of words out of some part of the brain. But words are not stored as sequences of sounds. They are stored as wholes, or at least as whole syllables in which the consonants and the vowels are not separate items. We should even consider whether consonants and vowels exist except as devices for writing down sounds. This may seem an odd thought for someone who is writing a book called Vowels and Consonants, and I must warn you that many people who are working on speech do not agree with the views expressed in the next two sections. But I hope to show you that consonants and vowels 
are largely figments of our good scientific imaginations. <laughs> you know, in a way, you couldn't restate uh, the map is not to territory any better than that. All right. The next topic, the pitfalls of drama. It is only one paragraph, and we'll get through this really quick. He talks about Larry Hagman, who played J.R. Ewing on Dallas, and how he used to get hate mail because people thought he really was J.R. Oh, and even better, back in the 1980s, the actor Robert Young played the title role of Marcus Welby, M.D., and people would stop him on the street and ask him for advice, medical advice. I think, hey, doctor, it hurts when I do that. Oh, I'll stop doing that. Uh, oh, and this one's great. Actresses Sissy Spacek, Jessica Lange, and Sally Field testified before Congress on the farm crisis, not because of their farm experience, because, but because they had acted in films depicting the difficulties of farm life. Perfect examples of people forgetting they're looking at an illusion. Oh, coming up after, there we go, after the pitfalls of drama, the next topic shall be the word is not the thing. Have a good one. Note to self, don't ask Irv to put together IKEA furniture. <laughs>